Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rana and I'm, uh, uh, I work at Forbes as a senior digital editor for Asia, uh, based in Hong Kong at the moment. Um, I'd like just to um, introduce to you what I do. Uh, basically, I work on the Forbes uh, Under 30 franchise in Asia. If you're not familiar with it, um, in short, it's basically a franchise that Forbes has started a few years ago in the States, where we have uh, we pick and highlight uh, different people under 30 who are uh, disrupting and um, their industries and contributing um, to it at a young age. So all of them are under 30. Um, we have 10 categories and we have 30 in each category. So in total, we have 300 people on the list in Asia. Um, this year, uh, Forbes decided to expand this franchise globally. And we started with a list in Europe and the Asia list, which I handle. Um, so for those of you who, who still probably have the um, uh, you know, perception that Forbes is only about billionaires and older entrepreneurs, uh, I'd like to show you a short video of our uh, Under 30 Summit, the first one in Asia that we did this May in Singapore, just to give you an idea of how Forbes is uh, relating to millennials. If you can play the video, please. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce here three uh, young entrepreneur, entrepreneur ladies who are on our uh, under 30 list in Asia. Uh, I'll introduce them to the stage. Uh, Rachel Lim, co-founder of Love Bonito from Singapore. Uh, I have Sylvia Yin, who is the co-founder and COO of Shopper App in Malaysia. And last but not least, I have V, uh, Le Huang Nguyen V, did I say right? Uh, from Vietnam, and she is the managing director of Adaroy.com. Please give them a big welcome. So, ladies, uh, I'd like you to just start by maybe introduce yourself and what you do to the audience in maybe 30 seconds. Hello everyone, my name is V and I'm from Adidas.com. I have a passion for technology since I was in school. When I was 13, I started my own web design company and I was fascinated with the idea of connecting buyers and sellers through an online platform just like Amazon.com, but I was so young and couldn't do it. So after my college graduation, I decided to go back to Vietnam and started my own marketplace. And luckily after five years, I got acquired by one of the biggest conglomerates in Vietnam and right now, I'm the managing director of Adero.com, one of the biggest e-commerce uh, company in Vietnam. Sylvia, hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sylvia, and I'm co-founder and CEO of Shopper. So we aggregate hundreds of brands into a single platform, and we build a layer on top of it using artificial intelligence and algorithm to recommend to our users brands and products that suit their style. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel from Love Bonito. Uh, so Love Bonito started out in the very beginning 
10 years ago uh, as bonitochico.livejournal.com. So a couple of my friends and I came together to sell our pre-loved clothes online just for extra pocket money. And as it grew, uh, we started to import clothes to sell. And just six years ago, we started Love Bonito where we would design and manufacture our own pieces to sell to women uh, in Asia. So all kind of fashion related, mostly retail and e-commerce. And all of you are obviously young entrepreneurs um, under 30. So I'd like to ask you, what inspired you to be entrepreneurs at such a young age? Uh, I think great things in life actually start from dreams. So uh, I always dream about building the biggest e-commerce platform in the world, bringing Vietnamese product to the global market. So that has always been my dream until now. And also, I'm very passionate about you know, bringing modern and convenient lifestyle to every family in Vietnam. So that's what motivated me to start my own business. So conquering the world by e-commerce power. <laughs> Um, as for myself, in 2014, I moved back from the UK and I was surprised that online shopping experience here wasn't as great as it was over there. So I was struggling to find an alternative to shops that I uh, shop from, like ASOS, Misguided Love, uh, sorry, uh, what do you call it? Boohoo, there we go. And uh, I know that's Love Bonito, but you know, being a millennial, I wanted more. I wanted now, you know, more, more, more. And I thought to myself, you know, how nice would it be if there's a single platform, smart and efficient, where I can find everything that I need about fashion. And that really, is, that's how shoppers started. I have a thing that I want to achieve. I have a problem that I felt responsible for solving. And then that's how shoppers started. So 10 years ago when we started in Singapore, the online scene in Singapore was unheard of, you know, like online shopping was like, what? Nobody has really heard or like nobody really dared to shop online. So we saw a gap in the market uh, and we thought, okay, you know, since being online doesn't require as much overhead cost as, you know, uh, having a stall and renting and things like that. So we thought, okay, it might be a good idea. Let's, you know, just try it out. And that's how we came. Um, as the name of this panel suggests, uh, your businesses and uh, even the word millennial these days uh, kind of means some kind of disruption. Uh, do you think your businesses were disruptive to the retail industry? And if so, how? Uh, so Adero.com is the first platform in Vietnam to offer online grocery. So right now we're offering 12 product uh, category, including, you know, very popular category like fashion, and also the new and innovative sector like um, online grocery. So what motivated us is um, we want to solve the problem for working mom. Imagine a working mom have to work from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And after 6 p.m., she has to go out to shop for grocery during rush hour. It probably takes her an hour to get home and cook for the family. So imagine now she can order everything online and when she gets home, all the ingredients are ready for her to cook for her family. So basically, we can save her an hour every day, which translates to you know, 365 hours per year, equivalent to you know, 7,300 hours over 20 years, would nearly save her another year to spend time with her family over the next 20 years. So that's what m motivated us to start this online grocery platform. And uh, we think it's um, kind of I hope that is disruptive in, uh, in the definition. <laughs> so your target audience is mainly young working moms? So our target audience is um, family in Vietnam. So basically we target uh, you know, from millennials to working moms in Vietnam. But basically we want to bring out the best products and services to every working family in Vietnam. Right, so how shopper disrupts. Um, if you think about how we'll shop nowadays. If I want to buy a top, I'll first go to this e-commerce store that I think will have the top that I want. I get there, I may or may not get what I want. And I move on to the next e-commerce store that perhaps my sister told me might have what I want. And I move on to the next if I don't find anything. So I can go through this whole process of elimination, but is it efficient? Not really, you know? So what Shopper does is that we use technology and we put it all into a single platform and that helps shorten the funnel of when a user desire for something and actually finding something. You may then compare us to, like, say, a marketplace, but we are a lot more nimble in that sense because we do not hold inventory or stock. 
And because of that, we are a lot more, we have a lot more dexterity. From the moment that, say, we sign on a retailer, we can get their products on to Shopper within like three days. Or if we want to introduce a new category, we can do that within a few days. So that's how we're disrupting it. Yeah, so for Love Bonito, we were the we were the pioneers of the online shopping scene in Singapore. So you know, back in the days, uh, I think we absolutely disrupted how shopping was done for Singaporeans, uh, especially for the young women, because back then all we knew was you know going to Bugis, Far East, and and shopping malls to shop and to buy. But we really brought about convenience to our target audience, where they could shop and buy online, which. Uh, is reliable as well. And I think beyond that, we also provided a range of clothes that actually feed the Asian women. I think one of the core key advantage of Le Ponito is that we cater to the Asian physique, to the Asian women. You know, sometimes when we shop with international brands like Zara and and the likes, you realize that, well, sometimes clothes fit and sometimes they don't. Well, but that's because they're really catered to the American and Eurasian women. But here in Love Bonito, we have really perfected the fit for Asian women. And I think that's how we have really disrupted the shopping scene in Singapore as well. So localization, in yeah. other words, as yeah. well. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, especially in Asia, you, age uh, or being young uh, used to be thought of as a disadvantage because you have less experience, uh, you're not exposed enough. But do you think, uh, especially with the rise of technology, and all three of you obviously have a lot of technology in because you use um, e-commerce platforms, do you think that you being young is now an advantage and how do you, as millennials, um, connect with your consumers differently? So definitely, you know, a lot of people think uh, young equal inexperience and unskilled. But I truly believe that uh, being young is a privilege. Basically, you know, we live in the uh, internet era, the smartphone era. So we we're very fortunate to understand technology. And we definitely think that technology enables us to connect with our audience easier. And also being young is a privilege because we're not afraid to make mistakes. So any, everybody here playing game online? Uh, basically, you know, being young and being an entrepreneur, you can make mistakes. It's like playing game online. Basically, if you play game online and you got you know, killed by a monster, you grow back up and you get stronger. So I, that's a privilege, right? Uh, so during my startup journey, it's been up and down, and every time I make a mistake, I grow stronger and using the new technology to empower me to overcome uh, the challenge that I experienced before. Okay. So taking a risk, you're not afraid to take a risk. Right. <laughs> Sylvia? Yeah, I definitely agree. So uh, V started when she was 13 and uh, Rachel started when she was 19. I started when I was 22. I felt really old, you know, like I didn't start as early because what she said was true, you know, the earlier you start, the more you, uh, mistakes you're able to accumulate and then the better off you are at some other uh, some point. Um, in terms of like, connecting with your audience as a millennial, I think that is a resounding positive yes. So two months before Shopper launched, I spent two whole months uh, validating the idea. So I took... Um, coffee chats with over 100 girls. And when Shopper was ready to launch, 50% of them came to me and said, hey, you know what? Um, I want to join you as an ambassador, as a Shopper ambassador. And I was very touched. And I truly believe because I, myself as a millennial and my target audience is a millennial, we connect. They could see my vision. They could understand what I'm trying to do. And so they, they came on board as Shopper ambassadors. They spread it to their own pockets of communities. And that was really how Shopper got its first lift off the first group of users. Yeah, so I, there's definitely advantage to being young. So a lot of being able to connect with influencers, you mean, and, and social media, using social media. Yes. Okay. And Rachel? So being a millennial myself, uh, I think it really helps because our core target audience are millennials. And so it really helps in understanding how the millennials are wired, in understanding uh, what attracts the millennials. Um, you know, these days, millennials, we are very discerning. You know, we can tell what's bullshit and what's not. And we have absolutely no tolerance for content that, you know, is just too generic. For example, even like we, uh, we, we wouldn't take to like TV advertising anymore or billboard advertising. It's really content that needs to connect with the consumers. And also being millennials, you know, we have absolutely short attention span. You know, I just learned earlier that, you know, uh, our attention span for humans used to be 
15 seconds, but now it's 7 seconds, and they, they're guessing even lesser for millennials. So it's really interesting how, you know, being a millennial, catering to millennials, you have to really capture the essence um, and the attention of the millennials as quickly as possible, because all we do on social media, we're just scrolling, 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 and they could easily miss any of your campaign or any of your messages. So being a millennial really helps me understand, like, how the other, my core target audience works, so, yeah. Do you think um, these uh, millennials are more of uh, trendsetters or followers in general? Well, they're both sides, I would say, and there needs to be both sides. But I think uh, a lot of millennials nowadays, they are uh, more willing to take the risks. Um, so, yeah, that, that is something that I see that is really encouraging. So. And you're in fashion as well, so um, um, I guess all three of you. Uh, and fashion is a very trend-driven uh, uh, industry. So how do you keep your business relevant and how do you build a trust in the brand you're trying to build? Is it harder for younger consumers to, to trust your brand or is it easier to gain your, their trust and how do you do it? Um, if you want to answer, yeah, first. Well, in this day and age, competition is everywhere it's it's more rampant than ever before so it's really important to stand out as a brand and for us here in Le Ponito, like you know Rana you said that trend is you know uh, it's ever changing so for us we really try and build ourselves as a brand that would really speak to people as a brand that understands women, a brand that understands Asian women, a brand that understands what works for you, a brand that wants the best for you and a brand that you know will, will create pieces of clothing that when you wear, you would feel confident. So, you know, trends, they come and go, and we would incorporate uh, the necessary trends that will work for Asian women into our line. But I think most importantly, essentially, we are building a brand that would really speak to the Asian women that tells them that we understand you, you know, come and shop with us so that we can help you be more confident. What about you, Sylvia? Um, I think it's in shoppers DNA because we use so much of technology we're able to respond to trends and changes very fast so if our partner retailers are pushing out like a new trend or for example we can react to it very fast so in terms of reacting to trend I think technology helps a lot and that's how we cope with it yeah and your business as well combines e-commerce with content marketing um, how has that helped uh, your, um, you know, building out an audience. So back to Rachel's point, right? People have very short attention span nowadays. You think about it, every time we whip out a phone and we hit that refresh button, it's like we're pulling on the level of a slot machine. We're thinking, what am I going to get? You know, the brain is constantly looking for something new, something exciting. Shopper understands that. And so we churn out content that are very bite-sized, that captures your attention. We do things like short articles on, on like, say, five things a working girl should have in her car, you know, very relevant, very short. We do outfit of the days feature. We do curated products lists because, to face it, like, millennials are all about curated experience, you know? So because our contents are so bite-sized, so easy to digest, we're able to do very quickly, test very quickly. And as soon as we get that across, our users know, okay, shopper is where I get to see a lot of new stuff. And once that's ingrained in them, they keep coming back. And that's one way of building loyalty through content. Quick, fast, easily digestible content. Okay. V, part of your business is fashion. Like, like you said, um, it's basically an e-commerce that combines everything. And um, one thing that's interesting, as opposed to um, uh, Shopper and Love Bonito, is that your platforms are in Vietnamese language. Uh, how does that help you reach a bigger audience? Do you think this is an advantage that a local company has over big international players in the Vietnamese market? So I definitely think that uh, local players like us can learn the best practice from big international players and understand the local market. So it's somewhat, you know, a competitive advantage that we currently have. But, you know, big or small, local or international, we need to understand what customer want because it's the customer that drive the market. And to us, you know, we always want, just like, you know, Rachel and Sylvia share, we need to understand, you know, how customers shop with us. So to us, uh, bringing that best experience to customer is critical. And um, it's, it's just to share with you guys, uh, you know, Vietnamese uh, product is very good. 
So our ultimate goal is to bring our products to the global market. So we start small in Vietnam, and hopefully, you know, in the next two or three years, we can come to Singapore. So Singapore, wait for us. <laughs> But Vietnam, like you said, is a huge market. Um, does that intimidate you, especially as a, you know, being young and, and working on something starting locally? So, yeah, Vietnam is a huge market. We have 93 million people living in the country. We have uh, 50 million internet users, and we have nearly 30 million uh, smartphone users. And that excites me. So I think, you know, I'm very lucky to be able to start, you know, one of the first e-commerce platforms in Vietnam. And right now we're offering, you know, innovative service. So, you know, we, we hope that in the near future we, you know, we will, we will be the disruption in the market, and uh, we will continue be the innovators to bring Vietnamese product to the global market. Yeah. What would you say is the biggest biggest challenge in operating in a market like Vietnam, being, you know, sort of developing but also its massive size? Yeah, one of the biggest challenges right now is the uh, infrastructure. So basically, you know, uh, in Vietnam, we ride motorbikes. And imagine that you order something and you won't receive it in the next five days, then it doesn't make any sense to shop online. So thanks to technology, with uh, advanced technology, we're able to deliver most of our products within the day. And especially for grocery, we are able to deliver our product within two hours. Uh, that's a lot of work. <laughs> it's not easy. So, imagine. <laughs> So one of the biggest challenges, I would say, you know, is uh, the infrastructure. And also, you know, Vietnamese, we are, you know, we're not used to shop online. So we need to overcome that and, you know, give confidence to the shopper. Educating the audience as well. Uh, Rachel, uh, you have the opposite kind of uh, situation. You're working in a developed market and in a market that is smaller. Singapore. What do you say are your uh, challenges uh, being Singapore based? Um, I would say for our challenge, you know, Singaporeans we are also tech savvy. Uh, we have a lot, we have a lot of choices, both locally and internationally. So I would say the competition is absolutely steep. Um, you know, the, in, in in this day and age, it's almost impossible to attain to 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 want to get absolute loyalty from your customers. I think for us, what we aim for is really being top of mind for customers. So that's how uh, that's direction which we are going to really. Um, give as much value as we can, both the tangible and intangible value to our customers. And yeah, to really hope that, you know, when, when, they, when they think of shopping, when they think of buying stuff, they would think of Le Bonito because, you know, um, the confidence that we will bring to them when they put on our clothes. So that's the challenge we face in Singapore. The competition mainly. And Sylvia, you operate in Malaysia, which is kind of in the middle, I would say. Yeah, <laughs> what, are you, what are your challenges then? I think our challenges is that a lot of people in Malaysia are still not very open to the idea of transacting online. You know, cash on delivery is a, is a huge thing over there as well. Um, a lot of people would still want to shop on uh, Facebook stores, Instagram shows, stores, not necessarily e-commerce stores. Um, fraud rates are high as well. So there's a, there's a sense of distrust towards um, transacting online. And that would be our biggest hurdle. And that's why Shopper comes in and we see the gap in experience. We hope that by delivering a better experience at the top of the funnel, more people would then be dripped down to the lower funnel, which is transacting. Okay. Um, how do you guys, um, or ladies, uh, engage with your customers? Because I think before retail and, and e-commerce or buying any product uh, was mainly built on trust and trust takes time to build. But nowadays with social media and influencers, especially in your kind of business, um, it's, it's a different uh, way, I guess, to build uh, trust and, and loyalty. So how do you uh, do that briefly? Uh, like we shared earlier, I think millennials, we are both trendsetters and we are smart consumers smart followers. So basically, we don't just buy random things online. We need to buy from the brand that we trust. So it's very important to engage your customer by building the reputable uh, brands and products. So basically, from my experience, uh, we don't spend huge amount of money on advertising until we can really build a good product. So we spend most of our money into product R&D. So we, we try to deliver the best product and the best service to our customers. And one thing in Vietnam is that we face the risk of, you know, um, eating unhygienic food everywhere. 
So basically, one of the most selling po uh, key selling points for us is we are able to deliver fresh and organic food to every family in Vietnam. So that's how we build our customer engagement. So product quality is still king, you'd say? Yes. <laughs> Sylvia? Trust. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, we try to make the experience on Shopper really nice, really fun, really easy, and that helps build trust. And then another way to build trust is that we try to solve every problem by thinking about how it would pan out if it was actual person-to-person -person interaction. You know, a lot of, a lot of times, um, we are driven by this goal, and we just want to, like, okay, we want to get the users to translate, we want to get users to translate. But if you think about it, if you meet someone in real life, you would first say hi, you know, exchange pleasantries. Then you guys become friends, and then you, you know, keep each other updated on your life, and then you create moments where you share an experience. And, you should, and if you are able to replicate that in the online world, you're able to build trust. So we try to do that. We infuse that kind of thinking into all our communication channels, you know, our uh, emails, our social media. How do we build up that trust? I mean, you don't go to a party and say, hi, I'm Bob, you know, let's get married. Then you become a creepy Bob, you know? So you don't go like, hey, you know, sign up to my newsletter, now buy my premium plan. You have to think about, chart it out, you know? Sometimes it's easy to forget because you don't see a face. You see your, user, uh, your user's email address, or I don't know, but that's about it. It's easy to forget. Yeah. Rachel, finally. Um, yeah, I think being authentic as a brand is really important. Uh, like, I was, like, I was, like I mentioned earlier, they are very discerning. They can tell whether you're trying to just hard sell them stuff. And also, I think millennials today, we are very heavily reliant on uh, peer reviews. Uh, so it's not so much about you know, what me as a brand tell you why I'm good. They really want to hear real peer reviews. So uh, that's something that Love Bonito, we are trying to build the Love Bonito community where real women give real reviews. If we're really good, you know, it comes from them. And if, there's, if we are really bad, you know, it, it is also authentic. So yeah, that's what we're trying to do uh, using real peer reviews that really drives marketing. Yeah, everything's democratized, I guess, with technology. Yes, very much so. um, I'd like to open the floor if anyone has any questions for the ladies. Yes, please. Okay, um, you guys talk about uh, scaling a lot and doing different things to meet your shoppers' needs. So I'm wondering, I haven't heard from the finance or the human resource side of how you scale from that end to, to do all that. You know, like how, how do you finance, um, you know, if, if you need more content marketing or you need to expand and do different things to accommodate your shoppers? So the well, it could be delivery or, yeah, you know, you talked about delivery, uh, you talked about uh, sizes and, you know, competition, being online more, digital. So how do you finance or build the teams around that? So I was very lucky because I started very, very small. So I started with one employee. And uh, my first company, when we got to the scale of 100 uh, employees, we, you know, we did an M&A with one of the biggest conglomerate in Vietnam. And right now we have 1,000 staff members in Vietnam, including you know, uh, more than 400 delivery men. So the best way for us to control our costs is to think about you know, how we can uh, keep our customer engaged with us and calculate the customer lifetime values. So basically, we can spend you know, $100 uh, to make a customer satisfied. And if she stay with, he or he stay with us for you know, three years and you know, uh, her revenue will be you know, $3,000, then we can get back that $100 and make another $200 profit. That's how we balance our finance. When I started my first business, it was uh, my own money and the investor money, of course. <laughs> but right now, uh, it's, uh, it's part of you know, a bigger company right now. And we got uh, funded uh, you know, by the group, uh, one of the uh, biggest conglomerate in Vietnam, called Vin Group. Um, Shopper is funded by venture capitalists. So that's, uh, we got our initial seed funding uh, from angel investor uh, as well as uh, 500 startups. So that's where we got our financing from. And I think outside, outside investments only work up to a point where like, you're before your Series A. You know, once you hit your Series A, you really have to show like, 
lot of uh, traction, lots of um, essentially like you know you're, you're, you want to see that your your compass is pointing towards that direction that you want. So there are various ways to finance a business. You can use your own money. You can bootstrap. You can get venture capitalists. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay. And building my team. How do I go about building my team? I yeah. I think it's, if we talk about team, it starts very right from the hiring process. I, you want to hire someone who is customer oriented, regardless whether that person is an engineer or just an accountant. So if you want it to be customer oriented, you have to suss out. I guess it's, it, it's like part of like, you know, hiring someone for, uh, for culture fit. So does that answer your question? Yeah, I think, sorry. Sorry. yeah, I just think the, the focus of the panel itself was more about consumers and how they relate to them rather than how um, they started and how they funded their businesses. But if you see, I think all our, their bios are online and they are in detail as well. Like you mentioned, you have, um, uh, you have been bought by WinCommerce and Sylvia has been funded by 500 startups and others. Um, so I think we're running out of time. So if, if any, one more question for one person um, can ac accommodate that or everyone's okay? Okay. Uh, Thanks a lot, guys, and thank you, everyone, for attending our session.